Black Star DJs. Black Star DJs. Welcome everyone, you are listening to Blackstar DJ's Worldwide Platform. Hey. The 
This is just a chance precious to Usher, our main man. And to the program, yes, we've got a few more minutes to stop. together to create the largest online god of music platform. This is how we do each and every time. Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs. All your top Gideon DJs Worldwide. That's right, shut down the background. Ghana songs for worldwide. Let's go. Follow the Black Star DJs movement on Facebook and Instagram. Black Star DJs worldwide. Or visit our website now to book Tom Gunny and DJs for your next events. At www.blackstardjs.com. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, Ghana. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are on this part of the planet. Um, I go by the name DJ Quakes. I'll be, I'll be your host for this episode of the Spotlight Show. I'll be hosting alongside DJ Kujo based in the UK. Uh, and we have DJ Big Daddy in the background. We have Selassie in the background. Listen, get ready for another entertaining episode of the spotlight show the show we call the ghana music talk show from a global perspective and today you know we have literally royalty in the building i'm saying that literally and figuratively because the caliber of artists we have oh my um, god there you go <laughs> right so if you're from Ghana, internationally, I mean, this guy has done some amazing work, not just as a musician, but also as a humanitarian. Um, his work really speaks out for itself, and we're going to get into his story. I'm talking about none other than the legend, Rocky Dawuni. Mr. Rocky Dawuni, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful. I love your intro, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, I you know, can't complain. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful day, you know. So uh, for me, it's all about when you wake up and you breathe in and you breathe out, you know, you give thanks, you know. So Absolutely. I'm glad to be here right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you this. By our tradition, Black Star DJs, this is the largest network of top Ghanaian DJs all over the world. We have a very special tradition. This On this show, we celebrate our artists. On this show, we have a very welcome, I mean, a very special welcome uh, for all our guests. And so for today, we have Big Daddy queued in, ready to go. We have a special five minute set on what Rocky, Dani, uh, Rocky Dawoni's music is all about. So we have a special set being brought to you so you get a taste of who we're about to talk to. We have uh, one of the top DJs in UK queued in. Big Daddy, are you ready? Let's 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 roll the music. Yes, I'm ready. If let's only go. our guest is ready, I'm ready. Yes, yes. Oh my God! Black Star DJs. Yes, Rocky. Do you remember this? <laughs> You know I'm, I was going to start with this. Time now, jubilation. Oh God, I wish I had an answer. Come on, we have to give it to you. This music. Come on. Come on, let's go, Rocky. And then behind you, all the people on the people on the Yes, DJ, yes, DJ, yes, DJ, yes, DJ, 
fire. When we you think of Rocky, the hoodie, then it's in Ghana. Why do you want us to take it slow? Come on! He wants to take our love slow. Ooh yeah, caress you with melody. Woo you with harmonies. Make the moment like a favorite song. Why should we be in a hurry when we have no worries? Girl, you make me feel alright. to blame. Rocky, please don't blame anyone. There's no one to blame. If there's anyone, please see DJ Pix. Come on, give me another one. Uh, uh, come on. Blast that DJs, we only know one of the till. Come on, please, we beg you. Give us another tale of the story. And to those of you who thought, Rocky only plays reggae. Wait for your next music. It's gonna blow your mind. Black Star DJs. This one is called Wara. Ichi. What did you rough not to know? Black 
Rockstar DJs. Uh. Odawara, oh. uh. Odawara, oh. Me wanna drive, me see the mother. Missionary joy. What's this so tough? Me come me hold my bow. Odaw me who I wear the energy, me see the mother. Rocky, who are you going to see this evening? Me to break up my bow. Odaw me who I wear the energy. That is not all. Wait for the next one again. What is it? Palogo style level. Hey, Rocky. Oh, boy. If I don't get money, will you still love me? Oh? If I no call you, honey, will you still love me? If I not get money, will you still love me? If I don't build your house, will you still love me? Ah. Come on, come on, my ah. baby, oh. Hey. Come on, come on, my baby, oh. And then let's wait for the last one. What a music. Be my baby. What's a video? Oh. Everything. Can't take your style. Eh? If I don't tell your mama, will you still love me? Oh? If I don't talk your papa, will you still love me? Oh? If I don't talk your baby, will you still love me? Rocky, I guess you know what music is coming oh, next. On, lady, And let's go. Oh. With all the collaboration. Come on. Let's go. You only thought Ronnie that wouldn't will be place reggae. But when it comes to high life, come on. He's gonna blow you out. Now listen to how he sang this music. Come on, sing on. Adi, 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 Adi. Ah, Boko. Ah. Okay, Rocky, take it on. Yes, oh, a rookie in the house. Oh my god, oh my big daddy, that was that was my that was my that was my so so rocky officially you're welcome. This is the black daddy you'll say welcome to the fraternity. Yes, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and um an honor to hear the, the selection, you know, because you know my music, you know, is really a reflection of what I grew up to, what I was influenced by, and uh, you know, my truth, you know. So mm-hmm. it's it's good to see it all like presented in that way where, you know, it's like a painting, you know, you go from the 
the very you know reggae cultural roots part to the very traditional pan logo and yes. also new crow type high life to yes. modern high life you know yes. and uh, then afro and all of that and it's just you know we are a product of that is who we are you know yes. so it's it's nice it's really nice yeah wow 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 <laughs> big daddy big daddy massive massive work i, I love i absolutely enjoy this thing um <laughs> so thank you oh my God. <laughs> so I'm, I'm telling you, man. You know, uh, this is actually the last track he played. This is actually my first time hearing it, and so I'm, I'm here. I was telling myself, like, you know, just what I know, I, I kind of figured Rocky out. <laughs> here, comes, here comes the next trick. Okay, so so now at, the, at this rate, I don't know what's going to come next. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know, he's, he's got a lot in the back. He's got a lot in the back. Come on. Yeah, yeah. When I did the research, then I came to know that Rocky is Rocky. Yeah. You see, I I always I always tell people that when even you consider, let's say, DJs, mm. you know, you look in your crate. Mm. When you look in your crate, the music that you are influenced through that you play, it's like spans a lot of styles, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So that is how we all kind of grew up, you know. So as a musician too, you are influenced by that kind of broad-based amount of music. You see, so if you, you know, and every music that you play, sometimes we are forced to adapt ourselves to a certain genre, but mm -hmm. we bring all our influences in that adaptation, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I feel so free and so like musically liberated to know that, you know, I can, as a musician, I can be influenced by all, all these things, but when I bring it out, I bring it out in a way that, resonate and reflects my own truth of it and i think in in that way there's that level of authenticity too that comes with the music and i i just i just feel free to always break away from genres and not become you know confined to one particular genre you know and then also to project the african aspect but in a more contemporary and new ways you know right yeah. right right absolutely and 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 you're pretty you're doing a pretty good job with that. I mean, I was quite impressed the way you have to, you you know your rendition of that of that of that sound right there, the last one. That was really good. So, um, so okay, so so Rocky, you know, um, I am particularly very privileged, feeling privileged today because, you know, I've known about your work for a long time. You know, I grew up, you know, I grew up in Ghana, moved here, um, for college and um and being here for a while and so you know your music is one of the ways i stay connected obviously with Ghana, um and the rest of the world um and and you know i've always i've always known your work but you know i really got obviously for preparing for this preparing for this conversation i really got very deep and I'm, i have to tell you i'm quite blown away with you know what you've been able to what you've been able to achieve you know over the span of your career um, and I can't wait to get in for people to really sort of, for all of us to kind of learn about some of the models you use, some sort of your branding, what you represent as an artist um, and all of that. So, um, so before we get in, I'll say, I want to say once again, thanks for coming on the show. This is a blast idea of the Spotlight Show. Okay, so before we get into your background, um, uh, let's start with, you know, I know you do a lot of work as a humanitarian. Um, and, and, and you are the voice for you know what you know for a lot of powerful initiatives and campaigns uh, with some powerful brands um, and organizations. And you're also a musician. My question to you is, from a branding and positioning standpoint, do you see yourself more as a musician that is that is also an activist, or the vice versa? <laughs> You know, it's a question that I've always kind of uh, grappled with myself. You know, okay. because. <laughs> For me, it's almost like, um, you know, every human being, you have, you know, their, what you do and also who you are, mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. and I feel that, um, you know, my embracing of the aspect of humanitarianism was also to, to some extent, bring uh, life into the message of my music. Mm. You see, because my music has always spoken about, you know, I've always tried to shed a, a light on social issues, you know, issues of empowerment, issues of, you know, people just becoming masters of their own destiny, you know, and then also people becoming also conduits for change. And I feel that 
all of those things, you know, it's fair and nice to talk about it lyrically and it's fair and nice to talk about it in interviews and to fair and nice to also talk about it on stage. But it is much more important when you are able to put those ideas to in action, you know. So I felt that, you know, being directly involved in issues that are on the ground and also connecting with, um, you know, without having that power to using the leverage of the power of my music to, to connect with organizations so that are doing that work, I'm also able to help them magnify and amplify their voices and also bring diverging people who are working towards the same ideas together, you know? So I felt that, you know, my humanitarian aspect allowed me to put my music into action, you know? And in doing so, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, that action also feeds my truth, it feeds me to know that when I'm on stage and I'm talking about a certain issue, it is backed by a level of truth and a certain uh, emperors that I'm out there uh, putting across. So it's kind of how I see uh, my, uh, the music and activism. It's almost like the two sides of the same coin. They complement each other without each, I don't think I'm kind of a complete personality, you know? And I think that that's what I always say that, you know, we. We, we can't come and fit into the box. We have to bring our own box, right. you know? And right. I think that I am kind of, you know, an artist like that, that is very hard for me to fit into, uh, to be uh, constricted to a certain way that is organized. I just come out and I do things and I express things uh, with a, the latitude of freedom that mm. I have. And I think mm. it's self-evident in, you know, those two aspects of my, you know, my career. Yeah, I see. So, so which one did you recognize first? Um, you know, your your humanitarian side, um, or or the music side. Which 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 one became your first passion? Oh, I mean, definitely the music side. But the humanitarian yeah. side, I think, also came from empathy. You mm -hmm. know, it came from just understanding that you know from a very early time in my my growth that understanding that you know we live in a, a very interconnected world, you know, mm. uh, whether it's in your, your home, your family, or in your community or in your country, mm. you know, so you have to know that, you know, whatever actions that you take one way or the other, that's not only impact you, it impacts other people, uh, you know, within your community. So you have to live life with the awareness of other people's rights, other people's thinking, other people, what other people want to, you know, it's not necessarily only you, you and you have to make adjustments to all of it. So that side of empathy was always there. But what really was something that I felt was present at first was more my knack for melodies. You know, when I was a little kid, mm. I recognized that mm. melodies were something that they, you know, they literally threw me into uh, a frenzy when I heard melodies that were, you know, like, let's say the class high life records that were being played on record from the Nanampe Dues to the, uh, you know, to the senior encores and all of those records. You know, you hear uh, called the Dr. KJC, all of this, and then all the traditional high life melodies and the stories. And, you know, so I was really attracted to melody and at the same time to the power of the lyrics to carry these melodies and tell a story and paint a world. You know, music, you know, that music became like such an interesting aspect of me. And I also discovered that not only could I, was I attracted to these melodies, but I also could kind of dismantle them easily. Like mm -hmm. I could hear a song and I'll be like, oh, I know how he, he did it. Oh, that is very simple. Oh, that is, you know, and I was like, I could do that, you know? So music was kind of my first, I would say the first thing that was ta a tangible reality to me. Mm -hmm. Then once I started doing that, then, I, uh, you know, the humanitarian aspect was more something that was part of my nature. So in the long run, I think all of them then became intertwined, you know, but mm -hmm. if there's a certain precedence, I'll say that music was the first thing that I recognized mm -hmm. and I recognize the power of music now to bring along my humanitarian mm -hmm. side too. I see, I see, okay. Let's talk about your early influences because um, I understand you grew up in the, in the barracks in the military 
uh, barracks. Yes. Um, yes. And then you also spent some time in the north where I think you're from. Um, how how did all that? And I think your father was also um, uh, uh, some point posted to uh, Egypt, where you know. So you kind of have this these backgrounds. Um, how how did this your your upbringing? Um, you know, from these diverse you know uh, uh, backgrounds sort of shape you as a person and as an artist. You know the the the, the uh, you know the important thing is that because you know uh, I studied uh, psychology and uh, philosophy in school, so there's a whole thing of nature and nurture. You know, like mm. in terms of what really um, is primary in defining a person's personality. Or um, I will say that you know growing up with that diversity. Um, makes a lot of sense to me right now. Obviously, during that time, I did not even know the value of it. It was just my life, you know. Mm -hmm. So my father, you know, came from a traditional royal family in the northern region of uh, Ghana, but he was the last born of his family. He left, came, joined the military uh, in, in Takrade, you know, and then they moved to Michelle Camp, and that's where we were all born. So when I was born, I was born, you know, she was literally my first language, you know, uh, you know, and then the other northern language like Hausa and all of that. So somebody, you know, who ancestrally came from the north, but born in, um, you know, Tema, literally uh, the middle of different languages and then also within the uh, the soldier military camp too. The interesting part of the military camp was that because the soldiers came from different tribes you lived in this small space where you had every tribe of ghana like literally represented because of the military uh, so language and culture and food and everything was constantly so i was speaking ga you know different languages and all of that you know a friend you know my ever the soldier and every soldier, you know, we invite you, you go and eat some nice apple, you know, a northern soldier, oh, wow. we invite you, you go mm -hmm. and eat this, you mm -hmm. go and eat that, you know. So all the children, we kind of grew up with that mm -hmm. type of diverse uh, Ghanaian, you know, you know, you can be in Ghana, but not really be experienced the tribes in Ghana. But that allowed me to really have a very intense experience and also of Ghanaian culture because of the military. And then also the military, also, there was discipline, you see, because soldiers, you know, the barracks was run very, very, very tight. You know, mm -hmm. soldiers, you know, followed certain codes. Mm -hmm. They had to behave professionally and all of that, you know. Mm -hmm. So military kids, you know, you grew up with that sense of discipline, that sense of focus, mm -hmm. that sense of drive, that sense of if you want to do something, you have that war mentality so mm -hmm. that was also part of it and then at the same time too, it was also in the midst of when uh, jerry rollins time that was when i was a little kid you know mm -hmm. so the may 15th coup to uh you know you know prior to that you had uh, the generals in the military who were in power so i was also at it it was also at a time when the Ghanaian military was also in power political power. So here I was growing with that diversity, but I was living in a barracks too. That was like the central point also of, of Ghanaian power, you know? And then in addition to that to my parents, you know, my father and all the soldiers were traveling to the Middle East and bringing in new records, new music that was not being played on the Ghanaian radio, but because they were stationed in Israel and in uh, Egypt, they had access to all these records. So. I felt that what it did was that although I grew up in geographically in uh, uh, what's called, I had a very uh, pluralistic uh, view of the world. And uh, also, I also felt that everything that was local also had a global component to it, you know. So it made me understand uh, in terms of the basics by the same time, the micro, and at the same time, to the macro. And I think that is what has also defined my music, whereby my music also, um, you know, pays homage to that kind of worldview. And it's constantly evolving, too, because as I travel as a musician, you know, my music is not static. Where I started, it's like new things that I become engaged with, too. 
which they can be created through me. So I feel that that upbringing has shaped me into a much more uh, fearless artist who can push boundaries as I see fit and also have the discipline to know to be focused on my uh, career and know that you know it's a long view type of approach where I work with quality every stage and not necessarily quantity you know mm -hmm. and I think that that is how that you know upbringing has helped also shape me and maybe has been an integral part of uh, my resilience and my longevity and my constant innovation to as an artist uh, till uh, today. Very nice, man. I, I love it. Um, so you you talked about. I have a few follow up questions, but before that, let me. I want to ask about your educational background because I know that you you mentioned about your degree in psychology and uh, and uh, philosophy, right? Um, do you think? Do you think that has that has really helped you as a musician? Um, that that I know you went to the University of Ghana. That level yeah, of yeah. I mean, a lot of correction. I, my final year, I left my final year. Okay. Um, right. Oh, we are losing. We are losing you. We are losing the connection. <laughs> I'm just saying that I, I. So I studied philosophy and psychology, uh, okay. and then uh, University of Ghana. Um, you know, during my final year was when I actually left, uh, and then uh, traveled uh, to. Uh, to the United States. But what I feel that my uh, university education did for me was that, um, you know, it equipped me with the ability to also uh, be able to articulate the things that I felt and saw, you know, and um, it also gave me the tools to, to be able to discern and engage and feel that that is where so my a lot of my work with the United Nations and also serving on various leadership committees around the world, uh, uh, both you know in the capacity United Nations, um, you know serving on the leadership council uh, for RFK Human Rights, Robert F Kennedy Human Rights, and all these organizations came from also the educational part too that I was able to really nurture. So not only was I a musician that had a direct understanding of things, both on the ground level and also a worldview, but I could also bring that also to places of higher tables and be able to have meaningful conversation and also be able to engage meaningfully. And I feel that the educational part of me was what nurtured that Phoenix, you know? So I think it complemented and to some extent added a little shine and has helped me to be able to navigate better and also be able to present my message too in a much more in a way too that can resonate not only with people that are audiences but also people in the highest level uh, uh, of government, you know, uh, society and around the world. That's, that's, that's powerful. Um, so a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people don't realize, and I think you kind of uh, touched on it earlier about your ability to sort of uh, uh, hear music and instantly be able to sort of dissect and understand the various components and how they all come together, which yeah. um, is, is so to speak kind of can make you a, a great arranger and a producer and a writer. You know, do you do you think you know? And when I think about when I think about you as a brand. Um, you know, one of the things that obviously is striking is the, the, the message, right? The messaging in your music, right? Um, and so do you think that's, would you say that that has been one of your distinguishing um, uh, 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 attributes as an artist, your, your that, that, ability, that innate ability to sort of understand music to that level? And, and be able to also articulate yourself on, on, on your songs and, and deliver messages the way you do. Do you think that has been one of the distinguishing factors? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, I think that what, that has been one of my distinguishing because, you know, it's almost like what it allowed me, I, I feel like, you know, the ability to be able to dissect music and 
also understand like the fundamentals of like like every track and also mm. even like a precog you know really you know, mm. like, oh this was what he was thinking this was what this artist was thinking you know i think it helped me um also refine myself to um in terms of my songwriting um i was able to distill the process artists you know hear a track i'll hear music and then so it allowed me the ability to also learn and evolve you know because it's it's like textbook you know like a musician you learn from listening you learn from observing producers just like as a dj you can go into a club and listen to somebody's set or somebody's mixes or how he makes the transition or how he rocks a crowd or how he does you know it's like how they use their tools to paint that is and then you're like oh this is how they do it you know like they get a crowd going slow and then they hit them in the middle and then they do that you can read those things and other people cannot read that but because you have the eyes and ears to see things that way, you are able you are able to say, oh, you know, my this is how my set goes. Maybe I heard a DJ do this. Maybe this is how I need to adjust mine too to make my set much more stronger and, and powerful, you know. So I think that the ability to be able to dissect that helps me as a songwriter to constantly refine my songwriting and constantly also uh uh improve things to certain weaknesses too that i have as an artist because you are not fully you know there's nothing you you know learning is a key part of evolution you know so i feel that that allows me to also be able to uh you know learn and then um i think and then what was the other other part too that you were asking um the um so you were asking about me being able to dissect and then what was the other part right, that right. I was asking in? how if, if you thought that I think you answered that I think if you thought that was one of the key things that distinguishes you as an artist um your ability to uh, to dissect and also your ability to write and, and articulate the, your messaging um yes 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 way. and then the message part too you know and I think that the it allows you also because you know I learned something long ago that there's one thing about having a message and another thing about being able to communicate is mm. and mm. i think that communication is the most important key of having a message and being able to deliver it you know is the difference between a bunch of words that are thrown at people and also setting information that is communicated with certain tonalities and stuff that allows people to turn your mindset from wherever it's wavering and focus wholeheartedly to comprehend what is being you know communicated to them so communication has always been something that i have always cherished and even my work uh you know with various organizations in the united nations and you know all these organizations you know communication has been a key part because i feel that you can have the greatest ideas but the only way to make to create real impact is when you are able to communicate and it's comprehended you know so it i felt that the uh, ability to understand music also allowed me to know how to utilize my words mm -hmm. how to also communicate an idea without being preachy you know you can we can all talk about people to rise up but if you go and you're talking like you're the guy on the mountain top and you are the guy telling everybody that they, you know, you know, because whatever message you're communicating and trying to do, you're also, it's also self-examination, you know, so how do you put it in a way that everybody feels connected to that message, although you are the one delivering? So that yeah. takes certain finish in terms of your words, in terms of your tonality and how you also put the message with mm -hmm. the melodies, you know, put a message with the choruses in mm -hmm. a way that the message also resonates, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, you know, people leave listening to the song, feeling as an upliftment, but at the same time to go in with something after thought of, oh, wow, this was what you were trying to really carry across, you know, and that all takes a certain ability. And I feel that those innate understanding of music help me to really be able to know the right proportions of words melodies choruses that i need to put in the song to make it easy for people to also resonate and also connect with me 
uh, in the message part of the song. Amazing, amazing, I'm loving this. Um, so you talked earlier about how your diverse background and experiences kind of has given you this worldview. Um, I, 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 I learned from sort of uh, my research about you, about this gentleman you met, um, uh, Kerry Sullivan. Um, uh, you I know, a lady, yeah, yeah, girl. Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Karen, um, yeah. Um, lady, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that you met in in um, in Ghana very very early, uh, based in LA, and, and and you know that she I think she became later on uh, manager, your manager. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see. So um, it, it was very when I was reading about you, you know, she came up as one of the most interesting or one of the most influential uh, 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 people in your career, so to speak, right? So my question to you is, before we get there, how, which three, besides uh, which two or three other people would you say, at the beginning, when you were sort of, in, you know, in the formative ages of your career, which three people yeah. were the most influenced and helped you be able to sort of, you know, get a foot in the door? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, Carrie was huge, 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 huge part of it, you know. Um, and then my older brother, who is the chief of Bumbo right now. Mm -hmm. So he was actually even the first person that convinced me after I was accepted in the University of Ghana and I refused mm -hmm. to go to university because I thought I'll be too educated and forget my music. Mm -hmm. He convinced me that, hey, leave Koforidia and come be in Accra at Ligon and study and stuff. And maybe you meet all your idols there. So he was mm -hmm. able to convince come to Accra and then eventually, you know, start off there. But also he was uh, part of my first early management team, you know. So my brother also was like a big part of that to help me start off to a certain extent. And then he became a, a chief, you know, after my father passed on uh, as the chief of our people and my brother went to become the chief. Right. So those, he relegated all of that stuff for the sake of our people, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll say, secondly, that is, uh, um, he was uh, influential. The third, uh, well, that's, that's, that's very hard in terms of the third person. Uh, the third person I'll say was my mother, you know, because my mother was like my inspiration. You know, my mother was like my, you know, person that will turn to me and be like, you have it. You just have to go. You just have to do it. You just got to go. You know, you just have to learn, you know, and was never, you know, because music was, music as a career was something that in our culture, sometimes when you take upon music, you know, you can have a lot of, you know, pressures, social pressures, because yeah. it is not regarded as a way to be able to create a guaranteed future. You know, yeah. so many parents are scared because like, okay, you know, you need to do something that they know that you're going to be employed. Music, shall they look for a gig? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so now it's not guaranteed. Say you finish up, I will get the gig, you know. So, so, but my mother trusted in my, creativity and will always encourage me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never felt, ever felt that my parents questioned mm -hmm. my path of being a musician. They Give were always there. They were always like, okay. So mm -hmm. I will say these three people were integral, you know, my mother for like the, the inspiration, the foundation, and then the fearlessness and the conviction mm -hmm. and then carry for being the one that curated and organized and helped really spread it. And my brother was like the one that helped me ground it and then also helped me solidify. All that. So I would say these three people were instrumental in making me ready to go out there and, and thrive out there. Mm. I, that's that's very interesting. That's not very typical of Ghanaian parents, you know, especially the ones that are very big on uh, education. Because I know, uh, you know, I read your dad was also quite big on education. 
Um, yes, so, uh, yes, yes. And so he's playing for the University of Ghana, and you say at the final year that you're, you're going to leave and explore music. How did he, how, <laughs> how did he react to or How did both players react to that situation? Because <laughs> I'm sure at that time to Ghana, you know, getting to that university was very tough. And so you are there, yeah, you're yes, yeah. year, you know. So well, you sit for common entrance, oh, and I remember that year there was a lot of my mates who didn't get admission, and I was admitted, and I said I won't go, you know, wow. and I was I was home, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and my brother comes home and he's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "Well, you know, I, I just want to get started, you know, because when I come to and I start studying, you know, get into this philosophy class and all of that, I'm not gonna." You know, I'm going to forget this because I feel this is my calling. And I feel that so many, I'm always being given excuses not to do it. So I want to get started, you know. But then he just told me, he's like, you know, you're going to be a better musician if you're a university educated musician. And I thought about it. Okay. Yeah. He's like, how many, how many musicians at that time, you know, he said, how many musicians do you know who are educated in the University of Ghana? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, he's like, yes, I told you so. Go get a go get a degree and add that to it and all of it. so you know he was pointing at certain advantages that mm -hmm. you know education would bring me and the first day that I understood on campus mm -hmm. I knew it was really the right decision because I met Yofi Brew uh, who was also a very who's always a very very key part to of my story. Uh, no, Yofi Brew is a younger brother of Nat Brew. Mm. Uh, Ghanaian musician Nat Brew, you know, and um, and I had been a very big fan of Nat Brew, you know, and the Naco Rex and Rex Oma and, you know, so when I got to Legon campus the first time, I met Yofi at an, uh, you know, at a, a gathering and we started talking and I found out it was Nat Brew's brother. Mm -hmm. And then he eventually, I told him what I did and he said he wanted to hear my demo and he heard my music and he really loved it and then he introduced me to other musicians on campus and then we eventually started the local crisis band which became the launching pad for me you know so so Yofi was also a very key uh, part of uh, my musical journey gotcha. You know? gotcha. so coming to Legon was definitely a good thing a good decision I see wow yeah your brother that that brother of yours, I, I, I hope you give him credit for that. That's probably one of the yes. best <laughs> advices that, that, that he gave you. Anyway, so before we're going to go on a quick commercial, but before we go there, we go there let me know uh, uh, three artists that you think most influenced your music or inspired you to get into uh, to music. Um, you know, I think it's artists and personality. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I will, I will say three figures. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Bob Marley was a big one because I was growing up at the time when Bob Marley's music was. Fela Kuti was a very big one too because, you know, all over the barracks and that kind of Afrobeat, you know, was a very strong type of African music that was being played. And then I'll say Kwame and Kroma. Oh wow. You know, were you know, these were like the three kind of dimensions mm. of my early influence because Kwame Kroma was also my gateway to also comprehending the importance of you know Pan Africanism, the importance of uh uh the, the importance of using that my my musical inspiration to as a means to to articulate that bridge mm -hmm. too that existed between Africa and the diaspora and also creating a sound to that to some extent embraced mm -hmm. you know became a bridge to for both places so mm -hmm. when you look at it critically Kwame Nkrumah's vision of the diaspora and connection was also under an underlying principle for my sound, Afro root sound, which was also fusing from reggae music to, uh, you know, funk to any kind of sound that I found in diaspora and mixing it with high life, you know, and traditional Ghanaian music and in a contemporary way, you know. So these three figures I'll say are the basis, but obviously there's so many other people too that were integral. And then musically too, um, I would not, 
but I would not finish without saying that one of the strongest of my musical influences too was Nana Kwame and Pedro, uh, mm. African Brothers. Mm. Uh, because African, before I even discovered uh, Bob Marley, uh, my mom was a big fan of African Brothers and used to constantly mm-hmm. play Nana and Pedro uh, records and music. And for me, that was really my the first artist that was really true to me and represented, you know, the African sound, the high life sound in a very global way. Before I discovered the music of Bob Marley and the music of Felakuti. I see, gotcha. I see. You know, I'm not surprised at all that you mentioned those uh, Bob Marley, Felakuti, and, and Kwabi uh, I think I could have predicted that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I, I you know, know, you know, very obvious. Right. right. The, the, the funny thing with that is that every, I'm making the connections between everything that you, you, you've been talking about so far, your fearlessness, you know, your, your messaging and all that. And, you know, each one of these these three, you know, sort of exemplify that. My, my yeah. The other common thing between these three is that, they, well, maybe besides the coma, they, they, they were murdered, right? Um, and so <laughs> I, I, I did... <laughs> <laughs> at this, at this phase, uh, are you, are you, are you? Well, we're living in a different day and age, but with the love, with the kind of messaging and the kind of impact you're having, of course, there's some risk that comes with that. Are you ever, yeah. are you ever concerned with, you know, with with that kind of risk at all? Oh no, no, mm. no. You know, you, you know, life is life is for the living, you know, and. You know, you go out to life and, you know, you live it fully and do what, you know, God put you here to do. And, um, you know, each man, you know, all that is born shall one day uh, pass on, you know. So, you know, nobody has to be afraid of what life will bring them, you know, and let them be, let that be. Uh, prevent you from living, you know, you're afraid of dying, so you don't live, you know, I mean, you know, it's uh, everything that you do has resonance, you know, but things are eternal when they are truthful, and they are also meant to bring light and bring, uh, make the human family and humanity better, you know, and I feel that that is something that you know, it's it's a great light, but at the same time, it's also a threat to those who are out there and feel that humanity has to be something that they can totally be able to sectionalize, organize, and control for their own uh, ends and means. But what we stand for in the music we bring that is meant to break that, you know, uh, it's meant to challenge that status quo. Mm-hmm. It's meant to also uh, show that status quo that uh, there's a certain power innate in a, an awakened people, and that power, regardless of whatever uh, systems that are in place, that power, mm-hmm. once ignited, can overcome any system. You know, so we're coming from a position of power, a position of fearlessness, and a position of knowing that you know um, our message is eternal, and what we represent is eternal. So we have no fear. We fear no evil. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, uh, that's the fearless legend, Rocky Dawoni. Uh, let's let's go to let's go to uh, social media, Kujo. Um, let's see uh, let's see what you know what's going on in social media. We will do a quick commercial, and, and, and then when we come back, we're getting more into. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Now, I've been sitting here, Rocky, listening uh, to you know the the discussion. Excellent. So far, you know we've got uh, DJs and um, several other people listening uh, globally. Um, blast that DJs, that's how we do it. So, so far, uh, I've got DJ uh, Flipper, who's uh, also known as uh, Jay Santi, says, well, Barak's boy. He can also relate because I think he also grew up uh, in the Barak's uh, <laughs> based in Canada. Yeah. Godin Yaya is also yeah. listening. We've got Ada listening, DJ Bante uh, worldwide. I'm a, uh, Mamiesi, our own Selassie uh, listening. Um, or watching us from Facebook and uh, obviously on the uh, Zoom as well. Uh, Sylvia Jackson is also there. Mark Darlington, a famous uh, producer, probably you might have of him. 
uh, based in the UK. Okay. He says, well, it's okay. always a pleasure to hear you talk. He says, well, you are one of his favorite musicians. Yes, and a big brother as well. So that is coming from uh, Mark Darlington. Uh, Selassie yeah. says, yes, uh, you are also his too. Selassie says, mine too. And uh, Selassie says, well, he loves the concept of quality uh, over quantity uh, that you've um, said in one of your comments. And yes, he also concludes by saying you are a very deep thinker, very deep thinker there. CD is listening. Yawa Jiman says, well, he's not surprised at uh, the things that you've said because that, uh, according to him, also shows up in your work. And uh, Mike Afrojam listening from uh, all the way from Canada. Um, uh, I think Mike is based in Amsterdam, uh, Holland. So Blaster DJ, this is how we do it. Uh, welcome, we still have a couple of minutes to go. DJ Kudu here right from the UK and I'm enjoying this. Thank you very much, Quex. Absolutely, uh, you thank you, thank you, Kudu. Um, uh, so let's see if you're ready, let's go on that very quick commercial break. It's going to be less than about 30 seconds. For 200 of your favorite top Ghanaian DJs across the world, coming together to create the largest online Ghana music platform. This is how we do each and every time of Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs. All your top Ghanaian DJs worldwide. That's right, shout on the background. Ghana songs for worldwide. Let's go. Follow the Black Star DJs movement on Facebook and Instagram. Black Star DJs worldwide. Visit our website now to book top Ghanaian DJs for your next event. the world at www.blackstardjs.com. Let's go, let's go, let's go, Ghana. Yes, 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 yes. Welcome back to the Spotlight Show. Uh, we're having a very, very interesting conversation with the legend, uh, the man that has made Ghana proud in so many different ways. Um, it, it, it broke a lot of international records. Uh, he's here live in college. Um, and, and, and we, you know, I'm telling you, I'm really, really enjoying this conversation. Uh, Rocky, once again, you know, thanks for coming on the show. I want to, I want to go, I want to sort of switch it up a little bit and go into some of the achievements that you've had because um, I think for people that are that are that are listening, tuned in, um, a lot of people might not realize, you know, sort of like the extent of uh, uh, some of the achievements you've had so far. And so I want to talk not just on the music side, but also on the you know humanitarian side, right? Um, so starting with the music, I know um, that you have you have seven albums out. Um, you are probably one, not probably. You are the only Grammy-nominated Ghanaian artist, uh, in, you know. <laughs> and so and so, big, big, big congratulations on that. I know. How, how did you? I don't know if you were able to catch all that debate that was going on on social media after the last Grammy. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I was yeah. actually, uh, yeah, you know, a lot, you know, the, the whole thing was, um, I felt that, you know, the, a lot of people were trying to, you know, when Nigeria, you know, our brothers in Nigeria had that opportunity and, um, and, you know, many in Ghana, you know, it made them just really start reflecting, you know, in terms of, um, you know, our music industry too, that, you, you know, personally, I've ne as I always said, I'd never, I'd never done music for awards, you know, mm -hmm. it was nothing that I ever, I really chased, tried to create excellent albums and great albums, you know, and worked hard and became influenced to, you know, to, to make that happen, you know. So my whole thing, my whole take on that was that musicians to stop when you stop focusing on winning awards, that's when you you become eligible because you create works are, are able to barriers. Mm -hmm. I did not have any structures like a big marketing plan, like even the Nigerians have. You know, I mean, they have like a whole slew of people and all of that kind of stuff. A nation that pushes 
and has been able to push them and so many Nigerians in a lot of influential places and even the academy, a lot of voting members in there to be able to reach that critical mass and, you know, you know, you know some nominations from there, you know. But, you know, we are a country, you know, we are only, you know, over 30 million people you know, a smaller country and in our history we have had that and we have not had the institutions to that have been able to push in a way that has, you know, will give us that profile. So I had to do it based upon just you had to create that body of work that can be able to navigate all of that. But I did not even know that I was doing that. You know, I just wanted to immerse myself, do good works, fuse. And the album that I always tell people that the album that was nominated to uh, was also an album that had fused, which was Branches of the Same Tree, had uh, seamlessly fused reggae music, Afro, and high life, but in a very temporary song-driven way. So the songwriters will listen to the record and be like, wow, you know, I see like really a complex song writing in this, you know, the people who were the reggae people will listen like, well, this is a reggae album, but I've never heard a reggae album that sounds like this. And then the Afro people will be like, whoa, you know, this is, this is like an Afro, this and, but it's much more contemporary, you right. know, and that was how that album came across. So it defied you know, certain print when it was because it was not genre specific, it stood out in the genre where it was, which was reggae album, you right. know. So I think that that was what the key was uh, to be able to finally push our music to that level for people in the academy to really recognize that God has actually been the place of innovation for even a lot of the global sounds, but we just have never had the opportunity to be able to push our music on, on that platform and create. But I think beyond that now, we have a lot more eyes and attention on our music. And I think that's the beauty of that nomination was that it opened the gates and brought, and it was also the first body of work. I always say that, you know, because it was the album that was nominated, you know, so uh, branches of the same tree. So it's like the first body of work from our country to be nominated. So people should work on creating that because that is where the power, you know, and certain art artists want it quick. They want to be on somebody's album and feature on and then, you know, get Grammy nominations and then say, oh, I've nominated because I featured on one song on somebody right. else's album. And right. It's right. like, okay, but you know, body of work, that's what we need, mm -hmm. that can stand on their own and do that. So I feel that what it did was that we arrived, you know, and, and, I, and, and even during my nomination, when I was nominated, you know, I mean, if you search, you can see on the red carpet, what I said was that I don't feel that my nomination was uh, just because I, you know, all of a sudden had the answers, but my nomination was a culmination mm -hmm. of years of excellent Ghanaian artists who mm -hmm. have chipped away and paved the way. And I just came in learning from them mm -hmm. and on their shoulders, creating an album that took advantage of all the inspirations that they gave me to be able to create such an album. So it wasn't something that was for me, it was something that represented our entire industry and an opportunity to, for us to use it as a stepping stone to move forward. So as I'm saying, like people like, you know, Amachi Dede, the Kodrian Trees, the, all the people, even the, all the current artists that I listen to and all of them were also all part of the inspirations that came for that album to be made. So it, it's, 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 I'm just a, a, the tip of that, a, what's it called, the arrow at that time. But now it's open, you know, and I feel that our brother Nigerians, they are much more organized and they have the, the, the numbers and they have all of that. But we have to use innovation and creativity mm -hmm. for us to be able to, to um, you know, stand toe to toe on that level mm -hmm. and not, you know, look at when somebody else gets it, then we are like, we, you know, <laughs> I, we are annoyed and self-searching and soul-searching and you know, but the thing is that we got it. We already have, we have the nomination, yes. Yes. you know, yes. we have a body yes. of work from our country that has had it. So there's nothing, it's a matter of the next step for us to take. Right. You know? right. It was, it was very interesting to me and how 
how when the conversation was happening on social media, a lot of people weren't aware that we actually already have someone, you know, a, a huge artist in Ghana that is already nominated uh, um, uh, and, and part of the conversation at that level, right? Yes. Um, did it, did, you know, and so did it, that begs the question, right? That begs the question. What, what you do and stand for is very much respected internationally. And at home, I know your first album, The Movement, for example, had, had yeah. huge success in Ghana. Um, um, but you continue to also have a lot of success internationally. Do you feel like Ghanaians understand today, Ghanaians really understand your brand, what you represent and appreciate what you're doing um, as an artist and for Ghana? I don't think that, you know, and the thing is that, you know, that sometimes I don't like to come across as, you know, an artist that feels like they're not, but a lot of Ghanaians don't even understand the magnanimity of some of the things that we already have done, you yeah. know, artists mm -hmm. from our country have done, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that is also our media sometimes shuts itself in terms of the viewpoint mm -hmm. and they don't even look you know to go back and know that and and it's and it's you know just to say just to you know i mean it's not to it's not to hit back at but the year that it was nominated um there was really ghana music awards that year did not even do any recognition of that oh wow the year that it was nominated yeah oh, wow. really? so <laughs> you know that's what i'm saying in that so all of those things, I mean, I don't, there's no need for me to talk about them, but those kind, but it's something that regardless, it was something that was a gift for me, for my country. So there was also the need for also that record. There was a lot of support in a lot of the media, but I feel that there was also certain areas that it was not really articulated mm. in a way that people knew that we have, our music has gotten to such level oh. And yep. we have arrived and we just need to keep trusting and believing and mm -hmm. pushing. The mm -hmm. ability to use that more, mm -hmm. I think that there's still room to do that, you know? And mm -hmm. sometimes I feel that, okay, right now I live in, you know, I spend most of my time, I'm based there and all of that. So sometimes I feel that, okay, it's also me spending a lot more time to and working a lot more time to in Ghana as I focus certain parts to internationally, you know, gone there, started locally, went internationally, created certain impact, and then go back to and start also working locally to bring all of that. So it's also all of that process too of kind of re-engaging. So I don't want to talk about it and come across as, oh, you know, I'm saying, oh, Ghanaians have been done this, Ghanaians have done this and that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying that the potential of what I have been able to do both in terms of as a musician, mm -hmm. uh, you know, performing on stages from Hollywood Bowl, you know, to collaborating with, um, you know, artists like from Bono to CB Wonder to, uh, you know, the last few days, you know, the United Nations with a high, you know, profile event that was with uh, from Dave Matthews Band to Jack Johnson to Ben Harper, all this, and also the, um, uh, you know, playing in various stages around the world and all of these things that when Ghanaian artists see, they would know that we are music gone to certain places and impacted certain places in a way that we need to be celebrating those achievements, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I feel that there's more to be discovered in that department, you yeah. know. So people yeah. know and no certain parts, but once they start peeling more, they're going to see more of what I've done. And I don't feel like, you know, I think it's egocentric and self-serving to always go and talk about your achievement. It's boring, you know. Yeah. So I would rather um, have other people discover it and just keep doing things, you know, as I but, go. But I, but, I, but, I think, but I think that, um, you know, like you're saying, we need, we need examples of success models. We need examples of people that have done it the right way and were able to make it doing it the right way. You understand? Yes. Um, and yeah. so, and so I think, you know, one, you know, one way of, I will not look at it at all as blowing your own horn. I mean, 
you are the only nominated, you know, artist in Ghana. You know, a while ago, CNN described you as one of Africa's top global stars, right? A lot of people regard you as Bob Marley of Ghana and maybe Africa. You know, you, your album, uh, uh, you have won an NAACP Image Award for Outstand, Outstanding Album, right? Best Reggae yeah. Song of Ghana Music Awards 2011. Uh, Best African Artist um, International and at the World Music Awards. I mean, the list goes on. The list goes on. And the idea that Ghana is not picking up on this kinds of achievement. And this is just, this is just on the music side. <laughs> on the on the human okay, the, the things why I try to tell people to think, you know, how much of my music has been used on American TV shows, exactly. you know, everything yep. with ER, yes. you know, to video yes. shows, e yes. video games, you know, um, mm. films, mm. you know, and all mm. of that, you know, mm. and uh, the sync uh, dimension of what mm you know the extent to which you know which our music too needs to kind of be able to impact in the, all those realms you know so it's uh there's a lot you know there's a there's a lot <laughs> i don't know if that doesn't interest the ghana media i don't know what you know because i mean even the south african you know when we're doing the world cup in south africa i know that is supposed to your to your songs you know, yes. and, put it, um, made, <laughs> and put it in the in the game. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, African reggae fever, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, right. It, it was, I mean, your video game, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, and and that was just, and I know they they've done a few of your songs on their on their video, yeah, yes, yeah, right. several, right. several, several, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if this doesn't interest Ghana media, then that you know that we should we should really be asking questions. What the hell? I mean, we talk about a lot of drama. We talk about you know, you know, uh, beefs and all this stuff, but then the things that really can propel and, and set examples and inspire, you know, younger ones to to strive for that level of you know achievement in the music space. We don't talk. We are quiet about that. That's ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, don't don't the, the, but don't I don't. Think don't I, I think sometimes you don't. Even, I think oh, sometimes coming at some point. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Conversation is about some things that have already been achieved. But then they talk about, oh, we need to go and get them, you know? Like, I remember even the Grammy thing is like, oh, we need to get a Grammy nomination. Like, some people, oh, I'll be the, you know, we need to get, you know, when, I was like, we already have that. We already have. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's amazing. I know, Kujo, I know you, Kujo, you, 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 better, you better come in here before I, I go off, because. This, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's all good, we are Ghanaians, so we can, we can, we can Force. talk and. Of course, of course. Of our history, you know? exactly. Clearly, uh, uh, Rocky, I think <laughs> at the beginning we did say that this is a, a discussion and not an interview. You know, I've just been um, sitting here just listening. Now, my question is that, you know, we've had quite a few artists, you know, big upcoming on, on this show. And there's always this challenge of uh, artists trying to go global. Some say that, look, you need to be big in Ghana before you go global. Some also disagree and also say that, look, no, uh, music is a global uh, language and why not target the whole world if, if you can? You know, so based on the conversations, the way we are going, in your opinion, do you think that becoming big in Ghana before going is the way forward? Or just looking at it as, you know, that big global targeting it uh, is, is the solution based on what your experience is, sir? You see, the thing is that things have changed right now because of uh, digital and social media and ability to also showcase your music worldwide through the internet. Whilst at first, you needed to send the music to some record company, they needed to sign you, they needed to print and make your music and send it to radio and promote it for people to hear you. You see, so right now, local is global. Hmm. You see... So when you are making the music, you have to know that whatever you, you're making, the eyes that are in the ears that are going to be paying attention are both the people who are within your country of influence and also ears and eyes that are also global in nature that could also seed a fan base outside of your country. And so I think that digital media and social media and the internet 
has changed that conversation today because what it does is that artists have to have their eyes locally because that is where your inspiration comes. That's where your authenticity comes from. But at the same time, you have to know that the quality and the nature and the level of material that you're putting out has to always be at a top level because if you think that you can serve the local audience with some shoddy goods and think that I'll prepare certain ones for you know international market, everything that you are putting is local, you know. So you have to now, now it's about putting the quality work, and the quality work will be able to impact and influence both within your own local market and at the same time uh, the global so the, 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 the ability to impact both simultaneously is available right now you just have to make sure that quality is your guiding principle i think that will that will that will lead you forward yeah mm. okay so yeah, let that, um quick let me go in for go ahead well, yep um rocky yes I have the privilege to watch you, um, one of your videos, and someone made a comment that if there is no God, he would have worshipped you. <laughs> and I was, I was just like, it was marvelous. Okay, the question is, after you've performed on a stage, yes. what message do you want your audience to remember you of? You know, the thing is, the, for me, music is communion. You know, music is meant to ignite the, the energy of understanding that we are all here at this moment, at this time, we are alive, and we have to be thankful for. You know, I want people to always remember that waking up sharing that energy with a group of people, sharing that energy with family, sharing that wherever you are, it is the greatest gift, you know, and the recognition of that is the beginning of happiness because once you wake up and you're happy to be alive, I mean, what else can make you be pissed off, you know? Even the things that, you know, your bills have been come and you approach them with a smile, you know? So I like to... That is kind of the key thing. And when I'm on stage, I like to draw everybody to the present. You know, it's like forget everything that is going on. Let's all be present. Let's be, let's, let's live, let's be alive, you know. And I feel that that is what my music always is about. It's about being in the now, being in the know, being alive and being grateful for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um and, and, and I think you're, do, you're doing just that. Okay. So um, <clears throat> bringing it, let me bring it back to uh, sort of like a follow-up to what Fugio was asking earlier. Um, you know, you've released uh, uh, seven albums. First of all, do you, are you currently, or were you ever signed to any record, uh, any record label? Or do you... No, you know, I, I'm kind of the kind of guy that walked away from a lot of, record deals you know <laughs> because it was kind of it was very hard to go and you know with my university education read a contract and mm -hmm. come and sit down and understand like wow what this means right, right, and right. and totally convince myself to go and sign it and you know so the thing was to be independent I knew it was a long way it was a hard way and build myself to control a lot of my catalogs for some time. Mm. And after a time when I felt that I controlled my catalog, I knew that I could go into partnerships with others because now I can afford to some of these partnership deals. I could do them because I had my own catalog as, you know, in the back, you know, so then albums like branches of the same tree uh, uh, was released uh, through Kumbancha, which was a label that was distributed, you know, had a huge global distribution and all of that, you know. So, and then, um, you know, I did publishing D Lionsgate Films, you know, when 
you know, some of my tracks were used on some of their TV shows and all of that, you know. So I started going into some of these, but it also all depended on the tracks I play and all of that, you know. So, you know, I, I believe in independence, but it was independence to also create my le leverage and also my foundation. I didn't want to be the artist that was signed like most artists, you know, that we know, famous, famous artists, successful artists. At the end of their career, you always see that they don't even have control of any of their works. You know, I'm looking at right now, like even De La Soul, you know, what's going on with them, you know like Tommy Boy owns their whole, and it's like one of the most impactful rap groups of all time. I mean, you think that these guys have done and they really have access, but that's, that's the way those record deals are, you know? And uh, it was very hard for me to come to terms with that, but I understood that, that industry, you know? So I also knew that, as they say, if the hunter learns to shoot without... Uh, missing the birds might just learn to fly without perching. That means you always have to learn how to make your adjustments, still be able to utilize your right. opportunities to move forward. So right. I did that to the best of my ability. I don't know if it was the right thing, but that is how I felt. Right got you, got you. Yeah. you know, the, the irony of, of, the, of, of, you know, the situation that you just described is that I understand that you did uh, 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 an internship very earlier on in your career in LA yeah. with a record label. Um, uh, but then when you're ready to release your first album, you you went and did it in Ghana, independent. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> so, uh, so a few questions come out of that, right? And based on, so based on your response to this. Um, on, on one hand, we all know that, you know, record labels obviously have the machine to be able to, you know, take you, make you move faster, right? Exactly. Um, but, but, but but the downside of it is that they want to obviously control and dominate you know your career in, yes. in, you know in many ways as well why why didn't you um you, first of all do you feel like if you are signed to a record label now now that you're looking back so in retrospect right if you were signed to, if you had signed to a record label you will be much further than where you are now um or, or, or what uh, probably in terms of more terms of clarity and all of that, mm -hmm. I think that uh, to some extent also impacted my music because you know and you do it a lot more than I on creativity. Maybe music changed a little bit more from what they came into. You know? So you know, when I feel that there it will give you because the comments you know you know the history the old you know tour tour sports you know view of the booking agencies and all of that you know it's a machine you know it will help you move forward faster and all of that you know so it will definitely help to expand it much probably be much more bigger mm -hmm. but I knew that my music itself, you know, it had the capacity to also go that way, you know, because once it's there, whether it's time or whether it's just grow and eventually acquire that stature, but it's not going to run with the, 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 what's it called? The, uh, the, uh, part of a record company right. for that to go faster, you know. So right. I was ready to take that long way mm. and pathway because for me, it's a mission, you know. So uh, and in certain missions, you know, sometimes it's not only about the limelight and then the, you know, have the ability I mean, it's good. I'm not saying it's bad because having the ability to to open everyone because you have a label is also a good thing. But the sacrifices that were needed sometimes for you to do that were things that everybody had to do for themselves. And I remember that, you know, for me, during my journey, I just made those decisions, you know, to be independent. And uh, and I live with those decisions. Uh, they were 
right decisions, you know, in my opinion. I see. I see. Yeah. Now the the you know I'm I'm also a business guy, so every time when I'm looking at you know music, I'm looking at it from a, also from a business standpoint because it is a business. Um, yeah. Now now I'm trying to understand that with with the decision to go independent. Um, was it was it that there was no room to negotiate a deal that allowed you to maintain control of your masters? Um, and where I, and I still give you, you know, the uh, leave space for you to explore this heavy machinery that these record labels bring, or was it more of you didn't you didn't you did, you weren't sure of the future, and so you didn't want to share in whatever risk or glory that that came with? No, I think it was also the whole thing of that when you sign, where you're gonna get that attention that you expect. Got you it. know, because at the time, uh, the problem with these deals is that it's not a matter of that you don't want to sign them, you know, but you sign and, you know, you've committed a certain number of records. Uh, are they, are they going to give you time and energy and start to support you as you expect? If they don't do, then all of a sudden you have, a bunch of records to release, but you don't have the machinery that you expected because they are not obliged in any way, unless it's reaching your contract that they're going to spend a certain number of money on each record and that right. a certain amount. They're not obliged right. anyway to, to once you're signed and you are committed to it, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I felt that the situation, I was better off being in control of pushing my odds, whether they were profitable or not profitable in the short term, but if in the long term, it will give me the ability to also keep owning my masters, mm -hmm. then I knew that at least at one point, those will be of value to me because I'll still be in control of some of my work, you know? So that was kind of the decision because it's, it's hard to, unless maybe you have you know, some big hit single that just comes out of nowhere and the record companies are chasing and running around to sign you quickly and they throw in money. And even that one, they will sign you for a lot of money and then you go there and it's not guaranteed that the next single is going to be, you know. So there was all of those questions because I had interned at a record label. So I kind of, it gave me a little snapshot of how the business was and also all the artists that, um, you know, before my first album came out, the, all the artists that I became friends with, you know, because I was doing college promotion. So I was constantly, I was, you know, you know, the art constantly calling me in terms of helping them push their records, you know, for, to chart on, uh, you know, college radio, all of this stuff, you know, so I was having an opportunity of talking to artists, you know, because they had to come and be friends with me to navigate, get attention that they needed. So you you know there was, so there was all these things that were were important to getting the label to help you push and it's not necessarily because you sign a deal mm -hmm. you know the the label is manned by people it's a business and it's a group of people so you have to have the inside people too who are there and a lot of times when it's a whole lot of artists and a whole lot of you know and you know certain advances to that you're getting that probably is something that you might spend all of it and then you commit to five albums and stuff and all of a sudden you have five albums to deliver and right. you've already spent whatever you've got for the first you know it didn't make business sense in the long run especially mm -hmm. for an mm -hmm. artist that i felt that my music was uh will take time to mm -hmm. grow itself you mm -hmm. know so mm -hmm. i knew that i needed that patience but i didn't know if somebody had that patience to to, 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 to help me move according to that pace, you know? So all of those were considerations that made me, you know, some of them, you know, I looked at them and they just did not make sense for me to gotcha. make that commitment for that, gotcha. yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Makes a lot of sense to me now. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, I think that, uh, could you, if you're ready, um, I, I see that social media is getting quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I see, yeah. I see a few no. comments, so let's go to social media real quick. Most definitely, yes. A few new comments there. Uh, Richard Jallo says, well, wow, 
uh, that is deep, very, very deep there. Uh, we've also got Fiano Rubin, uh, Mauli says, uh, saying, well, Rocky is a great artist and very deep in, in, in his messages, a true legend, very humble. I salute you, sir. Uh, Selassie, uh, you know, our own Selassie says, well, Grammy nominated. Uh, he's very smart. He loves hearing um, you uh, speak again. That's what Selassie is saying. Rocky is just so humble, rare quality in uh, our own legend. Uh, Yawa Jiman says what? Uh, 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 you are Ghana's version of uh, the legend uh, Bob Marley. And we've also got our own Kwasante here, uh, who is um, not able to join us on the um, Zoom today. Kwasante says what? Ghanaians by nature will always dwell on negativity with all their strengths more than the positives. Uh, hence, uh, why Rocky's achievements are more recognizable and celebrated outside of Ghana. Uh, sir, keep up the good uh, work. So that is what Kwasante is also saying. So these are um, some additional comments. I've also got um, uh, uh, Khadija saying, well, Ghanaian youth appreciate uh, the messenger and that is the most important uh, bit uh, coming from Khadija. Uh, Frazier there. Fantastic. So, uh, questions you can take us home now. Okay. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So, actually, if you're ready, that quick commercial before uh, we come back for the last segment. If you're ready on standby. If not, I can, I can go on. Okay. So, actually. Okay. Um, so, it seems like it seems like Salasi is enjoying this conversation. He forgot that he's the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's in. Two of their favorite top Ghanaian DJs across the world coming together to create the largest online Ghana music platform. This is how we do each and every time. Of Black Star DJs worldwide. Black Star DJs worldwide. I know I love you for my heart. I don't go lie, I want you for my heart. And then you bring it show me. Black Star DJs. Thank All you, your top Gideon DJs worldwide. That's right, shut right. on the background. Ghana songs for worldwide. Let's go. Follow the Black Star DJs movement on Facebook and Instagram. Black Star DJs worldwide. Visit our website now to book Tom Gunny and DJs for your next event. Anywhere in the world. At www.blackstardjs.com. Let's go, let's go, let's go, Ghana. Once again, welcome to the Spotlight Show, the Ghana Music Industry Talk Show from a global perspective. Hosted and brought to you by Black Star DJ Worldwide. We have with us the legends, um, the Bob Marley of Ghana, as they say, um, is in here with us, and we're having a uh, conversation about his journey and, and, and some of the decisions that he's made in his career. Um, so, uh, Rocky, I want to follow up um, on uh, on uh, what we're talking about uh, before we want to come in here, right? Um, I also see that you have quite a few events that you host, uh, your organization hosts around the world. Um, I see that you have the uh, Afro-Funky events, um, in LA, um, I read about the Thursday night club in LA. Um, I don't know if you're still doing all of that. And then you have the independent splash in Ghana, you know, that has been going on for a while. Um, it's very interesting. A lot of, a lot of artists or even record labels, um, don't think, and I know the, especially, you know, the, the, the Afro funk event. You know, these are very, very internationally, very successful. I know that that attracts a lot of high profile celebrities um, that attend these events. And it's very, very, very well attended, attended and patronized. Um, you know, in addition to your, I mean, you're gonna even put thousands of thousands and thousands of events, I mean, of, of people to the, to, the, to the thing. Is that part of sort of your marketing, um, your marketing and promotional strategy, or is this something that you enjoy doing um, as an artist? I mean, they're, 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 they're both, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them, you know, I did uh, like the independent splash. We stopped. We haven't done it for a few years just because we got very busy. So 
and we, but we're planning to bring it back for se but for several years, you know, it was like the concert that whenever I traveled, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I'll be on the road and I'll come back in Ghana. Everybody knows that six March, I'm going to be there. I'm going to play and stuff. So for years, everybody knew that. And that was, and then Afro Funky was also created also because when I started basing in Los Angeles, I recognized that, um, Although from my first album, The Movement, you know, um, you know, right from the onset, a track was licensed by Atlantic Records, you know, so I would, you know, from the first album, I was already getting like a lot of hits within like bigger realms of distribution, uh, but I was not getting bookings and all of that, which was a big part of the whole thing. And right. LA it was hard to break into LA because LA you know, they dealt with the cream of la crop from the world, you know, so it, in order for me to impact LA, I knew that I had to create my own uh, place. So Afrofunky was created as a means for me to have a space to do my concerts and at the same time to serve as a means to bring African music right within the heart of Hollywood. You know, so when we started, it just became a huge success, you know, and um, every uh, African artist that traveled anywhere had to come there, you know, because when you know that you you played at Afrofunky or you did your press launch at Afrofunky, you were going to get connected to all the media. So in doing so, I was able to attract a lot of the media and a lot of the power to that spot. Mm -hmm. where instead of me going out there individually. So when you talk about marketing, I think strategically there was that part, but at the same time, it was something that I loved because it had to come from a place of authenticity mm -hmm. because I wanted to create a platform for African music. And then we also used it every night was playing Afrobeat, Fela, Fela Kuti, all these diasporian musicians, all of a sudden, Hollywood DJs who were constantly coming were starting to program all of this African music again into their mixes of hip hop and all of that. I mean, Afrofunky was very instrumental in the resurgence of Fela's music mm. across the United States and ultimately leading to this Afrobeat explosion that has happened globally mm. because all of a sudden, every DJ, we were booking the best top DJs from around the world. And everybody that was coming to Afrofunky, everybody wanted to create a version of what we were doing there. You know, so I feel that that was also an impact too, that I and my partners at that time, you know, curated so that we can be able to also push African music and break new grounds and break new doors. And in doing so too, all of a sudden, my concerts were being sold out. You mm. know, every concert that I did there, you know, I even did a concert that uh, Stevie Wonder came and right. played with me to find, mm. you know, mm. you know, everybody from Prince will come there and spend time with me and hang out with me, you know. We like you know, you know, mm. Hollywood, you know, people came there. And then when it got to a time when I felt that we had reached the apex of its popularity, then mm. what we did was that now it's an event that we do it occasionally, mm. you know? So that's what I always do that. I don't like uh, things to that are creations of mine to, to get to a point where it starts going in decline. When I feel that we are on top of our game, then we pull it and leave it so that we can go on to new ideas. And every time we come there, people still remember it for that. So right now, I'm, I, you know, I just, I just flew into LA and everybody's like, is there going to be an Afrofunky event? And, you know, we have an Afrofunky event, like all these people, everybody, right. because right. everybody knows Afrofunky right. brings the family, it brings right. the music, people, it brings right. everybody together. Right. And that's right. what it's all about. You know, right. we created right. an enduring spirit and, um, you know, I think that, you know, when you go to a place where there's no path, you got to create a path. And I feel that all of those things has helped to bring African music to a level right now in Hollywood and all that. But most people would not even see the hands, some of the hands like ours that actually created systems of, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word Trojan horse because then everybody will say, so you knew all the time. I'll say, no, it's not a Trojan horse, but it was, that was the idea to 
have African music kind of incubate within the heart of Hollywood and impact it. And I think we are seeing the evidence right now in the global popularity of African music mm -hmm. in the mainstream here in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the matter of invention. So you had to create that. That's that's you know that's yes. that's um that's amazing. That's just that's just genius. The way you were able to just sort of take your own situation as an independent artist and create pretty much control your destiny, create your own opportunities. Global, yes. Yes. you know, and navigate a global music system um, on your own terms, which is, yes. which is, which is, which is amazing. You know, it's, it's a long and hard thing to do, but <laughs> we had to do it. We had no yeah. other choice. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, <laughs> I, I really applaud because you know we are in the space, so we really understand how difficult, uh, you know, to reach that kind of to reach that level of success. We know how difficult some people spend their whole lives; they never really get to half of that. And so to, yeah. to, to be able to get to that on your own is, is I salute you um, for being, you know, for doing that. Now, uh, uh, as we are coming to the end of the show, I want to bring it back to some of the things we are doing as a, as a Blaster DJ. Um, like I said, our mission is to sort of form a network as, uh, uh, as, as DJs and African music ambassadors, Ghanaian music ambassadors, even in the diaspora. A form a network to take that music global and be able to do some of the things that you've already done, right? So um, we're doing not just not just event, we're not doing uh, these types of shows. Uh, we're waiting for post-COVID to be able to start doing some major events that can almost become a major hubs for African music in terms of exposing um, African music to the world. Um, you know, I, I want to get your perspective on what, what how would you advise us um, or what are some of the things you would advise us, or strategies you would advise us to adapt in order to be effective in terms of taking um, uh, uh, Ghana music global? Oh, I think that, you know, it's really exciting to hear that there is, that, you know, you guys are coming together, you know, because it's, as I say, it's, it's togetherness and unity that will give you the power to be able to impact meaningfully. But one thing to that I would like to, let you know also is that you have the opportunity a rare opportunity to represent the expanse of Ghanaian music you know so uh, in your sets don't just be rehashing what is trending mm. you know you are at the, at the you know and that's what Afrofunky taught me Afrofunky taught me that we created, we brought like, we'll bring sounds from, let's say, Kumbia sounds from, it was one night that we traced the influence of high life in Colombia. So that night we had visuals from Colombia, we had Colombian food served and all of that kind of stuff. That's all part of curation. And you know, and you could hear all this music, like Ambulance music being interpreted by some Colombian band. It was part of their local music. And like all this stuff that was happening, which was showing that, and people loved it. So it means that people don't only respond to whatever is trending. And it's sometimes, you know, when you hear, oh, everybody's playing the same Afrobeat trending, five songs that are playing over, you know, you go to every party and that's all they're playing. You have the opportunity, ability to go deep find the gems of our music. There's a lot of great DJs who are out there using our high life music. Mm. When you go and they drop it like in a, in a stadium or in a place, they play a high life and everybody goes crazy. Mm. But mm. it's on me, but then you don't hear our own me, our own yeah. DJs yeah. like play that. They only play like so and so. You have the ability to mix it all up and represent fully who you are because there's so much power, you know, from the, you know, from the Felakutis to the Sonia Days to, you know, to artists like myself, artists like Hugh Masekela. Then you add the, you know, the, what is the Sarkodiers, what is the Stone Boys, what is the, you know, you mix it all in a way that you create your own. Uh, dimension of an experience that is ours. So that's what I want to You have to push all of Ghana music, the good, strength, cutting edge, beautiful, creative Ghana music. And that's when you are going to start standing out too. 
because people will know that you are not really rehashing, you mm -hmm. know, because, oh, everybody say, oh, Afrobeat is in every time you go to every party, bah, 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 same thing over and over again because people are reacting to it. But the audience, when you are in control, it's like you have the mic. Yeah. You can take them anywhere you want. And that's the beauty of a DJ, that yeah. you are in the driver's seat. You can take them on a journey. And if you want to take them on a journey that they don't know, that's yeah. when they remember you. Right. So we should challenge ourselves and become a medium to harness, you know, yeah. like, you know, when we was playing, people don't know that I have like all these high life songs, right. all right. these other songs and that kind of right. stuff. You know, most Ghanaian DJs don't know. And they, they, you know, they always think about because they've not done their yeah. homework yeah. enough to look at what yeah. I have put out there. You know, but when you look, there's all this other stuff that can work in so many, and let's start looking deeply and dredging and picking the good ones and adding it to our set. And then all of a sudden, this will represent a brand of sound mm. that is not that is not like everybody playing, but it's mm. something that is authentic, is Ghanaian, is cutting edge, is new and mm. fresh and is groundbreaking. Quick, so yes. let's listen to his Afrobeat. You will love it. Absolutely. Go ahead. Let's go and listen to yeah. this. Yeah, let's put, let's, put, let's put the first minute of it. I will cause so much trouble when I speak what's on my mind. It will take words just to know what the difference is. With time, all things will blow over as winter becomes hot summer. Just like yin and yang, you know what the difference is. Now they tell me I'm too much. I don't have to behave as such. Stay calm and it shall come a slice of pie high in the sky. I could not wait no more. I know you're by my side. We gotta take a chance if we are gonna ride the tide. We cannot go wrong. Woo! If we cherish what will make us strong, makes all the difference. We gotta go on. We've been sitting on the face too long, makes all the difference. Like Star DJs. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm telling you, Rocky, at this rate, uh, I don't know when your know, piano sound is going to come out. So, <laughs> because. It'll come, oh, it'll come. <laughs> <laughs> it'll come. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like, I like the, the, the dimension where you can take your music and. and, and yeah, you know, you take it and then you add songwriting to it and mm -hmm. you expand it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so you yeah. don't stay like yeah. where everybody goes, you know, so. Absolutely. As you Absolutely. innovate and you embrace it, you know. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so 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 we are we are, I know I ran out and my people are going to kill me, but I have to bring, you know, I can't talk to someone like you without talking about legacy. Um and so and so um you know what first of all, you know, two parts of the legacy question. First question is what impact do you want to have on the people coming behind you? The younger artists. Maybe someone thinking, you know, I want to do it on my own. I don't want to go the record label route, neither. Uh, maybe I want to do independent. Or would you advise these people to go to find the right, the right balance? What What is your advice to the younger generation coming up musically and how to strike the deals and all of that? What What is What is your What is your take on it? My advice is maximizing the opportunity. Mm. You know, and making sure that what you know because. Everybody is presented with different opportunities and every play field is different, you know, so you have to look to magnify the, uh, the opportunities that you're given and utilize that to advance what you are doing by the same time, not lose yourself. You see, so, um, you know, it might not be the way I went about it you know, if it's presented it to another artist, but the artist can find out that, okay, I could be able to let myself this way and do this. And then through this, I can be able to do that. I think that it's all about individual choices, but in the long run, make sure that regardless of what it is, you are always striving for excellence and you never stop learning and you never stop growing and you never stop kind of trying to improve things 
I think when you have all of those, like instead of trying to follow the crowd, go home, you are working on your craft. You know, when everybody else is out there at the club, just like doing, I don't say don't have fun, but when you have fun, you are right there. You never lose sight of that. And when you have that work ethic with that talent and with that focus and also the ability to recognize opportunity and leverage that and utilize that, I think success is a byproduct, you know, so that's all I'll say. And, you know, everybody has their own story and their own path. So I can't give a one size fits all. All I say is that just be true, sing your heart out, believe in your truth and go out there and stick your claim and everybody else shall see it. And stick your claim. I like that. Yeah. You know, if you're an African coming out, it's only rehash what uh, that one just said. I believe you recognize opportunity and maximize them to the fullest, right? But yes. in so doing, do not lose yourself. Try for excellence and have the perfect work ethic. That's, I mean, you know, it couldn't get any better than that. This is this is solid advice um, for a proven model. If you want to get Grammy nominated, <laughs> try. <laughs> <laughs> that is the formula, absolutely. Okay, the so other part of the legacy question is, when it's all said and done, you throw in the towel, how do you want to be remembered? Me, yes. as a guy who loves farming and mm. loves singing and just loves jogging the mountains and loves life. Mm. And, um, you know, just utilize my God-given gifts to magnify God through mm. people. Mm. You know, and I think... That is what my purpose is. It's just true music. People get to come to terms with who they are and find their own truth too, you know. So I, you know, I want people to know that, you know, this I've been given a message just like everybody. Mm. And you have to deliver it diligently mm. and with all your strength and with all your might. And the message will deliver you too. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I absolutely, absolutely, I will say, I'll probably say one of my, uh, by far, one of my favorite uh, uh, conversations I've had on the spotlight. Um, the, you know, the, 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 wisdom, the wisdom, you know, the, 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 how rich the ex your experiences were. So thanks for um, sharing all of that, all of that with us on the spotlight show. I wanted to, I wish we had time. I wanted to get a lot more into your humanitarian aspect of it, but we might, we might just have to invite you back. Um, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for another, another session. Um, but I will say, I will say this to you. I think on behalf of, um, last that DJs, um, we see your work, we recognize your work. We do appreciate what you're doing. Um, you know, for Ghana and, 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 you know, just, being you and you know excelling at the level at the highest level, um, and the you know the recognition that that is bringing um, Ghana, and so uh, we respect your work. We are looking forward to collaborating with you in any way um, in the future, whether through events, whether through uh, a, a release, whether through a campaign, um, whichever way. And my EP, my new EP. Everybody should grab the new EP to Voice of Boom Boom. Yeah, everybody should yes. grab that new. All the DJs who are listening. You should get that EP. That's where I, we have like all the cool songs that are being played right now comes from the new EP. So all the DJs should grab it and add it to their playlist and push it out there. There you go. You 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 heard that. Um, and I think uh, after this, <laughs> we have we have um we have a, a DJ Big Daddy. You know, on, on standby, we're going to do another you know ten minutes of just pure rock and Darwini hits um, and some of his good music. Um, and so, like you said, you know, he's, he's on pretty much all the platforms. Um, we're also going to share some of his music um, through the links and some of the playlists that we create. We, we'll, we'll send out a rookie that we need playlist to all the DJs so that um, you can you can look him up and definitely add him to all your sets um, when you do. Uh, and so, look, I say you are the fearless legend that is humble and, and serves your God and appreciates life. We appreciate you too. Thank you so much. Uh, for coming on the show. Uh, we look forward to doing more with you. Right?
Thank you for having me and all of you taking the time to, you know, and uh, I want to wish everybody a pleasant Sunday. Um, you know, I was, I've been, you know, I've just been, been in the play, plane flying. So I got here and I've been hiking. So, you know, I'm going to go into the mountains again today. You know, wow. so, <laughs> so everybody enjoy. <laughs> You have, to show, you, have, you have to show that lifestyle. I need that in my life. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie the mountain, so go get vibes. You go know. get vibes. Go get yeah, clear your head. Uh, yeah, clear yeah. your head, you know. <laughs> Corona, Corona no day mountain Corona top. No day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and definitely whenever you're coming to the East Coast, uh, I live in the DMV area, the, the Maryland oh, area. Oh, cool. Yes, yes. Yeah, whenever you're in the area. I know you've performed at the Kennedy Center before. Um, yes, yes. So, so whenever you, you're in the area, let's definitely connect and do a proper face-to-face -face, uh, because, you know, this, this Zoom era sometimes can be some way. Um, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we meet yeah. personally, then we connect we connect for real, you know. Exactly. So thank exactly. you all. Thank you all for taking exactly. the time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate thank it. you so much. Again, once again, make sure to cop that. We're all Rocky Dawuni songs, iTunes, you know, uh, Spotify, all the platforms, stream the music. He's all over the place. He has his new EP. Uh, uh, Big Daddy's going to showcase a lot of his music yeah. right now. Um, but thank you so much, Rocky. We are, you know, you can stay on. Feel free to leave. You can stay on also um, to enjoy. Big Daddy, but everybody, you know, stay tuned. We have another ten minutes of just pure classics from Rocky Dawuni. All yeah, right, my so, video, my video will be off, but I'll be listening. Okay, awesome, awesome. No awesome. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much, Rocky from yeah. the UK as well. Yes, all right. yes. All I'm right, taking brother. you all God the way. You all. Thank you for the time, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Love you all. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. All right, Big I'll Daddy, take over. Yeah. To all the journey to the voice of Bundu. streets are empty Now we're panic buying bread from every shelf Social media is in a frenzy for an enemy that nobody can see Mountain top Yes, Rocky, is dedicate this music people. to the beautiful Let's people on this yeah. platform. Come on. Got a song for you, my beautiful people. My beautiful people, come and sing along, yeah. There are many things we cannot hide. There are many bonds that can be undone. Just like our bond, yeah. Everything in life is a sacrifice. But I know. Yeah, he calls this one an elevation. United with Rocky the Winner.
an endless race. Got to keep stepping out. This one too is on the voice of the Buddhan. It's called Born it's to Win. Yes, Rocky, you are born to win. Sitting by the river banks, tossing stones and dreams. You were born. That's the title of this song. It was a place where I always seek a solace When I needed to get away from the rhythm of the city But now fast forward in here we are In a city where you can lose who you are Hustlers In a city so mighty That's another vibe down there. Job be for us. Yes, root reggae. It's a class one from Rocky again. He's called Conqueror. He's conquered everywhere. Hey guys, go and grab your copies. Wow.
this one is sweet brighter day i heard him saying waking up early in the morning Star DJs. African reggae fever, catchy, catchy. When you get it, hey, you miss that DJ play is spreading. It is the common man stand now to make it. I'm playing it rocking. It's for the rockets from Accra to Kingston. It is the common man stand now to make it. This one is called Ben One. Hey, I don't know what um, Rocky is going to Ben, but he only says he's going to Ben only one, and not two. Let's go. He's got a fire. We the people have a new proposition. This one butterfly. I love you so. Ah, I love on you so. The streets where we live. On the street where we live.
butterfly don't cry. And then we're gonna end it with the only tune that most of us remember, Rocky. Old days. Yes. When I play it, you get to know what I'm talking about. The tune I'm talking about. I remember Ghana. It was a big tune that then. That we all grew up with. Come on, Rockies, let's go. The people are The people are know. The reason why we still grow. That's the reason why we still grow in. Rocky, it's been an opportunity to have you on our Blaster DJ platform. Yeah, keep up doing the good job. Even if Ghanaians or Ghana doesn't recognize you, hey, remember Blaster DJ, we are here. Uh, I really, really know. Yes, Nancy. It's a spiritual tune in there. Quick, one minute and then you take over. Charlie, we have to make you uh, uh, Rocky's official, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> official DJ in the, in the in the UK. The way the way you're rocking the vibes, Charlie, I can feel the vibration. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling it myself here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice, very nice. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thanks for staying and tuning in uh, on the Spotlight Show. This episode of the Spotlight Show. We had an amazing, amazing, amazing conversation with uh, Rocky Dawuni. Uh, make sure to check him out. Um, you know his uh, his new EP is available and out. Check out all the diff- all the different um, all the different platforms. Uh, make sure to add him to your playlist. Um, you know, as as all the as Blaster DJ list. You know, we're going to support our own. We're going to push him all the way that we can. The new EP um, uh, once again is called Voices of Bourbon. Voices of Bourbon, so you know you can find it on iTunes, you can find it on all the platforms. Make sure to check it out. We'll also send it out to the Black Star DJ Networks. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, this is the Spotlight Show brought to you by Black Star DJs. 
Um, this is what we do, the Ghana Music Industry Talk Show with a global perspective. On this show, we give you the inside story, not the exaggerated you know, uh, media drama stuff. We give you the inside real stories about our artists, what motivates them, what inspires them, and some of the models that have worked. And so if you enjoyed the show, make sure to share the link, tell a friend to tell a friend about Black Star DJs and, and the shows that we do. Um, we also have other shows during the week. We have on Thursdays, we have Drop the Tunes, where we drop some of the upcoming Ghana music that is not mainstream, but we want to make sure we give other, uh, all kinds of Ghana music the opportunity to be played on the Black Star DJs platform. Um, on Sundays, we have, uh, just before Drop the Tunes, we have the back-to-back -back team giving you just mad vibes, you know, a bunch of DJs coming together to bring you mad vibes. Um, Ghana music vibes, uh, sets and stuff like that, that you can enjoy on the Blast Idea Media platform. Um, we, also, we also have um, on Saturdays, we also have uh, DJs rocking it. I think it's, uh, 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 what, uh, Salasi, I think you have to come in here um, for the Saturday show. I think uh, Big, Big Daddy, you know. Big, you know? Daddy's, Big Daddy's instrumental in the Saturday show. He leads the pack of Paul okay. the Saturday so, Bash. So, Saturday bash. Okay, Big Daddy, tell us, tell us more what people can expect. Yeah, Saturdays, uh, it's a flashback on the Saturdays. Uh, we've got um, a lot of DJs. Mostly, uh, we've got a, the starter and then, you know, the um, top up, the main meal, and then the um, the dessert. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, the Saturdays is a flashback, uh, which is right. going on for uh, weeks back. So, we're still growing. We're still growing. Very nice. Very nice. I, I love it. I love it. I've I've seen I've seen your show a few times, and I like I like the experience that you curate. Uh, you know, I love your energy. I love your presentation, and it's always fun to, to tune in. So, um, definitely, you know, everybody check it out every Saturday. Um, and then on Sundays uh, early around nine a.m., we also have uh, DJ our very own DJ Prince Paul bringing you one hour of pure praise and worship gospel. Um, so, listen, guys. Last that DJs, we want to represent all genres and all kind of all kinds of Ghana music, you know, gospel, old school, reggae, roots, you know, or in Rocky Dawoni's case, Afro roots. Um, you know, we bring you some of the popular stuff as well, um, and, you know, mainstream, you know, and all of that. So this is what we're about, you know, representing and taking Ghana music to the world. So um, check us out, blastardjs.com, or make sure to follow our page, tell the shout our page to your friends. And let's take Ghana music global together. You say, I want to say a big thank you to Rocky again. Um, I want to big say big thank you to my co-host um, uh, DJ Kujo and yeah. DJ Big Daddy. Thanks for making this show always fun and possible. Um, but until the next one, next Saturday, I want to say we salute you. Tune in, stay safe out there. Black Star DJs. Over 200 of your favorite top Ghanaian DJs across the world coming together to create the largest online Ghana music platform. This is how we do each and every time of Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs Worldwide. Black Star DJs. Bring All your top Ghanaian DJs worldwide. That's right, shut down the background. Ghana songs for worldwide. Let's go. Follow the Black Star DJs movement on Facebook and Instagram. Black Star DJs worldwide. Visit our website now to book top Ghanaian DJs for your next event. the world at www.blackstardjs.com. Let's go, let's go, let's go, Ghana.